I am New York. Yes, I'm New York. I am New York. Yo soy Nueva York. Solo New York. Just me New York. We are New York. Welcome to Diverse City, where we explore New York's eclectic enclaves one neighborhood at a time. I'm Zyphus LeBron. This month, we're taking a special look at redistricting. Put simply, it's the process of redrawing voting district lines on the federal and local level. It's usually done every 10 years after census numbers show policymakers how communities have grown or shrunk. To say that the process is fraught minimizes just how complicated and contested it can get. For example, this past spring, New York's newly redrawn districts were challenged in court. The state Supreme Court found that the U.S. Congressional and State Senate districts were drawn with, quote, an unconstitutional partisan intent. That just means the party in power drew the lines to suit their needs. The lines were ultimately redrawn by a court-appointed neutral expert, but that threw things even more out of whack. In one case, it left a longtime representative without a seat, and it merged some communities while ripping others apart. On this episode, towing the line, the difficult task of redistricting in a diverse New York City. Asian upheaval, a push for political power that reveals some infighting. And exploring the dark arts, a look at the perplexing process of map manipulation. Those stories and more coming up on this special edition of Diverse City. At the top of the show, I talked about how the state and congressional district maps that were released in the spring had led to some chaos. Now, there's a totally separate process underway to create new city council maps. The New York City Districting Commission's task of drawing this new map has been complicated, in part, by a mandate to comply with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Shannon Ayala has the details. <laughs> This last summer, a city council districting commission held its first set of public hearings as part of an effort to draw new maps for the city's 51 districts. The commission not only had to consider a larger population with expanded Latino and Asian communities, but also the Voting Rights Act of 1965. That law made it illegal for any level of government to discriminate against voters based on race or color. The act later included language minorities, which can include Asian Americans and Latinos. So what the Voting Rights Act says is that if you can draw a district where there is a majority of one of these racial groups and that there's political cohesion, right, where they are actually voting and supporting one candidate, and the majority, which tends to usually be the white majority, has consistently voted as a block to defeat their preferred candidate, then you have the basic requirements of a Voting Rights Act district. Jerry Vadamala is an attorney with a civil rights organization called the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. He says that though the Voting Rights Act grants protections to black, Latino, Asian, and indigenous populations in redistricting efforts, things can get very messy when redrawing these lines in a racially diverse city like New York. Many times communities of color will be pitted against each other and uh, will be advocating for their community, which is nothing wrong with that, but in certain circumstances it may be at the expense of other communities of color that are you know, all protected under the, the Federal Voting Rights Act. Shaking up the maps can definitely cause a stir, as this public hearing demonstrated. But the chair of the City Council District and Commission, Dennis Walcott, says he's game to navigate this minefield. Whether you're a protected group, uh, a group that we view as an opportunity uh, group where there's an opportunity to create a district based on that particular background, we look very hard to make sure that we follow uh, the Voting Rights Act, but also take a look at 
uh, racial block voting and what it means in different neighborhoods, those who come out of a particular ethnic or racial background and analyzing that. We put a lot of staff work into that process. Despite that effort, there's still been controversy around ethnic enclaves that weren't kept together in the first draft map drafted in the summer in places like Richmond Hill and Woodside, Queens. One of the most controversial parts of the draft map was in Brooklyn. The commission created a new Asian district by carving the Asian enclave out of Sunset Park and joining it with Bensonhurst. Critics said this violated the city charter by splitting Sunset Park in half. The charter says neighborhoods should stay intact. Critics also said it divided Latinos by separating Red Hook from Sunset Park. We ask that you go back to the drawing board and return with a map that does not carve up Sunset Park. Walcott says it's more complex. I mean, yes, there's an argument about that, but again, it's based on the analysis and based on uh, the experts, and we know there are a lot of opinions around that as well. Um, but we're very sensitive to making sure we don't diminish the power, especially of the power of groups that are protected. And so we've been trying to be extremely sensitive to that. And again, there are going to be adjustments to the maps as we go along. And where people have feedback, we take that into consideration. And then as a result of that, where those adjusts, adjustments are appropriate, we'll do that. Um, is there a conflict uh, between trying to balance uh, keeping ethnic enclaves together and keeping neighborhoods together? It could be an inherent conflict, but I think the reality is that our goal is to minimize and not eliminate any of those conflicts. More public hearings are expected to continue throughout the fall. The commission's deadline for submitting a final plan to the city clerk is February 7th, 2023. Shannon Ayala for Diverse City. The recent wave of map redrawing has created a few Asian majority districts. Many of these areas have very large Chinese populations because they are the largest Asian ethnic group in the city. Now, this community that says it's been long overlooked is ready for a coming out party. But as I found out, there's some debate as to the best way to do that. Just say that I, it's been the honor of my life to have been able to serve my constituents for the last six years. This past summer, Yulai Nu was touted as one of the front runners in the newly redrawn Congressional District 10 that, in part, merged Manhattan's Chinatown with Brooklyn's Chinatown in Sunset Park. Then came the debate over the creation of City Council District 43. Those new lines would have created another Asian majority district in Brooklyn. In, in that map, District 43 now uh, combines the Chinese part of Sunset Park and the surrounding area, the Chinese neighborhoods of the surrounding uh, area, uh, including Bensonhurst uh, and some other places. As of the reporting of this piece, the lines had not been codified. However, that story revealed a growing rift between the area's older Chinese immigrants who welcome other racial minorities and others who don't. You see that those people who um, support 43 in the new map and, and saying, saying this is uh, our opportunity to elect our own uh, Asian uh, council member are more likely to be new immigrants, grassroots new immigrants. Rong Xing is a reporter for the Chinese newspaper Tao Daily. She's been covering the city's Chinese neighborhoods for 20 years. She says this debate over the proposed district is indicative of the bigger battle going on as the Chinese community tries to assert its political will. So those people, older generation, who uh, support the idea of uh, solidarity are more like left-leaning. And the people who support the Chinese or Asian majority district are more right-leaning new immigrants. These conversations about the nuances of the Chinese community's political leanings and Yulai News' run for Congress are coming at a time when the city's Asian population has grown by more than 345,000 people. In Brooklyn in particular, that population has grown by 43%. Despite that, there's a problem. The 
community does not have a member of the city council who is from the Chinese heritage, nor does it have a elected or assembly representative uh, in Brooklyn, despite that huge population. Elizabeth O. Young works with the APA Voice Redistricting Task Force. It's the largest coalition of Asian American organizations involved in redistricting in New York City. She says that the Asian community is ready for a homegrown candidate that can unify the voting bloc. The candidate has to be able to mobilize the community to want to be involved in the political process. No easy feat because for you know many decades they have felt left out of the process because of gerrymandering and other things that they didn't feel that their vote counted. But this latest round of gerrymandering and redistricting has pooled many centers of Asian power. This is part of a confluence of things that have emboldened the city's Chinese community in particular to become more politically active. Another inciting incident was when the Chinese police officer, Peter Liang, shot Arkai Gurley in 2014. They considered Peter Liang's indictment as kind of a blow to the Chinese community. That was the incident that set off a serious um, protest throughout uh, about two years after the incident, you know, through his indictment and sentence and the whole process. So that was the thing I see that awoken the Chinese community. Even with all this impetus, Rong says she has her concerns about whether this push for political power will amount to anything. What I worried uh, is the division uh, within this community would kind of like reduce the uh, political power of the community in some other ways. I mean, um, American politicians tend to uh, listen to just single ideas, right? If you have a unified ideas from this community, I think that will work better. Understanding new electoral maps can be complicated for the everyday person. So the people at the CUNY Graduate Center's mapping service have put together a dynamic mapping tool that makes finding the new electoral districts as easy as the click of a mouse. Craig Thompson explains. Redistricting in You is a website whose main feature is an interactive map that's been compiled from different bits of data from the 2020 census. What our center does is we have a lot of experience working with census data and electoral data, how people vote. We apply it to helping to visualize the districts and to see what the population patterns are within each district. Stephen Romolewski is the director of CUNY's mapping service at the Center for Urban Research. His team first created a similar map after the 2010 census. He says that the maps were created to help New Yorkers, everyone from residents to reporters, navigate the sometimes complicated process of redistricting. Journalists use the map all the time because on TV they can visualize the map and show their viewers how the, the lines would change. People included it in their articles and so you can see the map uh, when you're reading an article and realize, oh, that's how my district looks now and how it might change. Uh, stakeholder groups use the maps extensively to educate their uh, uh, constituents and to use the map in their planning. It's for that reason that the maps are designed to be user-friendly. To make it easy for anyone to figure out what district they're in now and how that district might change. It's a really easy way of just typing in an address or clicking on the map and zooming right to your area. These maps were particularly important during the most recent redistricting. The 2020 census illustrated that many communities nationally and locally had undergone dramatic changes. This District 17, State Senate District, was drawn to make it a predominant, almost a majority Asian district. A lot of the stakeholders really wanted that because they, that, that gives an opportunity for the growing Asian community in this part of Brooklyn to elect someone of their own choice. So that, you know, means a lot for the population that has grown greatly in New York over the last 10 years. John Molenkoff is a political science professor here at the CUNY Graduate Center. 
He says that these maps are key to establishing a fair representation for communities whose numbers are growing in the city. The second core principle of redistricting is fair representation of minority groups that have been discriminated against in the past and to make sure that the dis districts give them a fair opportunity to elect people of their choosing. Because it's easy to diminish that if, if you had a concentration of a particular group, let's say a, a Puerto Rican or a Latino population, uh, if you split that concentration up into four or five different groups, districts, then that, that group is just a small minority of any, any district and is not going to be able to have much influence. That influence, Malenkov says, can determine who gets elected to government, especially on the local level. How these council members relate to the individual people and communities in their, in their districts is, is really important, and whether a community feels like it can connect with its city council member. The map is currently available on the website redistrictingandyou.org. For Diverse City, I'm Craig Thompson. We hear the term gerrymandering a lot when talking about redistricting. So what is it and why is it such a problem? Vanessa Monet tells us about the origins of this twisted practice. Gerrymandering undermines the ability of a person's vote to count because it, it predetermines the outcome of elections. Michael Lee is senior counsel for the Democracy Program at the Brennan Center for Justice. The center is a nonprofit think tank attached to the NYU School of Law. The Democracy Program focuses on a number of areas, including working to ensure the voting district map drawing process and its outcomes are fair. In our country, we have a long history of not having good map drawing processes, and we work to reform those uh, at both the state and the federal level. In at least 30 states, the state legislature has primary control of the redistricting process meaning whichever political party is in power gets to influence or approve the new district maps. This usually leads to biases within the map drawing process, which can physically appear as gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is the term that we use in the U.S. to describe the manipulation of maps for either partisan or other discriminatory purposes. Now, here's where it gets tricky. This process can be done in two ways. One is called cracking. If you had a, your full choice, what you'd want to do is divide up people who don't support your preferred candidate or political party so that they're only a small part of each district not able to win the election. And that's a process called cracking. The other is called packing. Sometimes communities are so large, and in that instance, what you would want to do is what is called packing. You'd want to put people of a different political party or a disfavored group in as few districts as possible in order to make sure that your favorite party, your favorite group, wins as many districts as possible. Gerrymandering in this country has had quite a winding history. It's a term that dates back to 1812 when Governor Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts signed into a law a map that contained a district that uh, clearly was drawn for political purposes that many people thought looked like a salamander and what the many pundits then called it gerrymandering. That term has, has stuck since then. But while Governor Gary's actions led to the name, the practice of gerrymandering predates the term. It actually was something that the, the founding generation did before that. Patrick Henry, who we think of as, as for give me liberty or give me death, um, also was governor of Virginia at the time. Virginia had to draw its very first congressional map. And he hated a man named James Madison. And he tried to have the map drawn in a way that Madison couldn't win election to Congress. He was unsuccessful, but even the founding generation was engaged in gerrymandering, trying to manipulate maps for political purposes. This map manipulation has gotten even more sophisticated these days, and Lee says more dangerous. It used to be that you just had precinct level election results, but now with sophisticated modeling that political campaigns use or that consumer product sellers use, 
uh, you're able to create really sophisticated profiles of voters based on what they post on Instagram, what kind of car they drive, what magazines they subscribe to. Then you can use that to construct a model of whether they are a likely Democrat or a Republican, how strong a Democrat or Republican they are. And with that, you're able to draw maps that are much more pernicious and that really stick. And well, gerrymandering used to be a dark art, it really is now with this new data, a dark science. While the practice of gerrymandering continues throughout much of the country, experts have identified some possible solutions. The simplest one is to break up the single party monopoly. The gerrymandering really takes off when well, one party has control of all the marbles. There are things that you could do like create an independent commission, which California, Colorado, Michigan, and Arizona have. Um, where you have an independent process for selecting members of the commission, you have strong map drawing rules, and you have to pass maps on a, a multi-party or pan-party basis. The Congress has the power to mandate that congressional districts be drawn using independent commissions. An early version of the For the People Act actually would have done that, and it's perhaps possible that before the next round of redistricting, Congress will take action. For Diverse City, I'm Vanessa Monet. The Democratic primary race for Congressional District 10 grabbed a lot of headlines over the summer. But there were some other high-profile reps who were affected when district lines were redrawn. Our Macaulay at Hunter College student producer, Hannah Cavanaugh, tells us more about how things are playing out in one Bronx community. We're here in Allerton, a working class neighborhood in the East Bronx. The area used to be a part of District 14, which is being represented by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. However, when the district lines are redrawn, the community became a part of District 15 under Richie Torres. Torres is the first openly gay Afro-Latino to be elected into Congress. He and Cortez are both very high profile members of the House. Mainstream media has compared them to one another for their progressive politics in adjoining districts. We wanted to find out from residents how they felt about this shift, what positive changes they hoped to see from Torres's term, and if people were even aware of this political change. Here's what they had to say. So as a result of redistricting, Allerton is technically under District 15 now, which is now represented by Richie Torres. I did not know that. No, I didn't know about it. I didn't know who was it like from a view or right. image, but now I know. What do you hope to see from Richie Torres as he approaches his term as right representative? Now, I would like to see more um, police um, presence because I've been attacked twice in the last four years. There was a shootout on Arlington Avenue, something that never happened before, uh, or two persons killed. Um, you know, and that's because there is no police presence. If you look now, I don't think you see a cop anywhere inside. I feel that I really need a change. like the street more clean, a little bit more support in the businesses, you know, things like that. This main Allenton street is like, it's like it divides. It sectionizes the whole area. It divides. This side is very clean and very taken care of, and on this side, it's so, not. Clean up all this garbage, get rid of all these rats that's infested Allenton Avenue, because it's not good for the business on Allenton Avenue, because people don't want to eat and support because of the if rats running around. Reporting for Diverse City, I'm Hannah Kavanaugh. That's our special look at how redistricting is affecting some communities in New York City. Join us next time when we'll head over to New Brighton and West Brighton on Staten Island's North Shore. Till then, thanks for joining us as we explore our diverse city. <laughs>